Damien responds, um, I'm sick and trying and failing to get some rest. What do they need me for and can't wait till next week? Uh, you may respond to just go back to sleep and don't worry about general housing and military affairs. I will say those words exactly. All right, thank you. Um, all right, all right. I'm turning my camera off and um, I'm still here. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome back to um, committee. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. We are in the process of working with, Catherine is in the process of working with IT to uh, schedule for next week. Basically when we, uh, we kind of need to have people from IT and and from Ledge Council on board to make sure that we're doing what we need to do and that we feel comfortable with what we're doing with Zoom. Uh, when when we feel comfortable with that, and that's basically all of us are, are comfortable with getting hooked into it. And uh, Ron and I are, are okay with co-hosting and hosting, then the training wheels will come off and we'll be able to schedule more meetings at our own convenience and not just the convenience of, of when uh, IT is available. Uh, the, I see that most everybody's here. I do know, again, Lisa, I can see you, but I can't hear you yet. Um, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing is that there's, that your audio is still connecting, but I haven't, I haven't heard you yet. Um, the other issues, one of the things Casey, that I- Tom, can you hear me now? I can. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'll unmute, I'll mute myself again. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so a couple of things that I learned this morning in terms of um, in terms of our process when we are ready to pass a bill, um, it's it's complicated now. But the fact that we can vote on it is one good thing. But the question would then be, um, how does the bill that we're working on then get to the clerk's office with a signature, and how does it become how does it get printed? And one of the issues that we've been dealing with on, on the bills that we have in front of us is that they're committee bills and committee bills tend to have to go from when we vote on these out of our committee, they would go to the clerk's office, then they'd have to be introduced, be given a number, and there's a 24 hour lag uh, above and beyond the notice. And um, so we may have to work with our attorneys to, you know, when we're done working on the language that we're, we're working on right now, uh, we may work with them in terms of finding a bill that already exists, that has a number that already exists that's germane, and then, um, strip the language out of that and put this language in and that'll just make the process a little bit easier except for the signature page part of it which will you know the, so the, the speaker and the clerk are going to work on a process and that'll be forthcoming sometime i would imagine by early next week so today we're um, going to just concentrate on hearing about the bills that we've been working on um, yesterday we heard a lot about uh, the proposals being put forward and the new language being put forward that that really did tighten it up and I do want to hear um, from again from Angela but I want to start with Chris because Chris you um, you basically had expressed two weeks ago that having the word foreclosure in this bill is a difficulty in many different ways and so I wanted you to explain that and just from a committee's perspective I think I think if this, if this is a banking issue, a foreclosure has to do with banking law, not only Vermont, but federal, the correct committee for that aspect of this would be um, the Commerce Committee. But I also understand that the federal government has made some provisions for foreclosure protections. And Chris, I hope you can just share that with us. I'd be happy to. So good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee members. Uh, if I can just digress for 30 seconds. Uh, one of the messages I want to leave you with today is that the banks are open for business. We are designated as an essential person, if you will, for our industry. And while it looks differently as far as having to conduct business through drive ups and ATMs and online banking and so on, uh, we are open for business. We are well capitalized so that we do have uh, Capital that can be made available, we know that there is a significant sum of money that is going to be coming from the federal bill that passed uh, the Senate, it's soon to pass the House, and we know we have a significant role to play in uh, the distribution of those funds, working closely with our partners. I would ask that if you have any constituents 
who are outreaching to you and expressing concern uh, and looking for relief. If they have loans with financial institutions, both business and individual, they need to get a hold of those financial institutions as quickly as possible. We want to try and work with them to minimize any potential problems. Better to do that before you're 60 days behind, 30 days behind. We have been given a great deal of flexibility uh, by our regulators. That includes not only our department in state, but our federal regulators to try and do what we can to work with our borrowers while keeping in mind the safety and soundness of the financial institution. We are continually every day seeking greater clarity on how far we can stretch these limits. There is, uh, as you all know, this is completely unprecedented. 2008 looks like nothing compared to what we are seeing out there right now in the growing demand. Uh, over time, the longer this continues, the greater the demand becomes. So again, they need to communicate as we are being aggressive in communicating with people to try and work through these issues sooner rather than later. With regard to the topic of foreclosure, I would uh, start with saying that foreclosure is very different than an eviction process. Foreclosure in Vermont takes quite a bit of time to go through. There, um, you, you start with a delinquency point where the borrower is not paid, but you can file your paperwork and then you have an extensive mediation process that you have to go through. Uh, and sometimes it can take upwards of two years. If I've seen some given circumstances that take longer than that. I can assure you I can assure you that nobody is being thrown out on the street because of COVID-19 circumstances. We have seen our members who, have, uh, who are not moving forward with foreclosure. I have seen banks like Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase who have put moratoriums on foreclosure. We have uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and any federally backed mortgage now has a foreclosure moratorium placed on it. There is language, because I know representative, you asked me to, to uh, comment on this if I could. There is language in the federal package that deals with homeowner protections, forbearance and moratorium on foreclosures. There's also language in that package that deals with moratorium on evictions. So both of those are being dealt with uh, as we speak by federal authorities. Um, we are trying to take a case by case approach to our individuals, again, recognizing the severity of the environment that we are in right now. I, I should also add listening to uh, testimony yesterday, uh, even if we were to file documentation with the courts today, the courts are not going to be moving forward with those document with that process, if you will, um, because of the circumstances they find themselves in and the rules that they have been releasing. So do I think you need to do the language in the bill? Um, I think the industry is already beyond your language and has already implemented your language. So honestly, I don't see a need for it because that's what we're doing. Um, there is a time when circumstances change uh, and when this ship gets righted and you begin to move forward with uh, those foreclosures that are currently in process now. But I can again assure you if it's in process now, Either the courts have slowed it down, or again, we've made the decisions. We're not throwing people out of their homes because we know the severity of the stay in place order from the governor's office and the administration. So I saw your bill language. I also saw some language that was circulated by legal aid this morning. Um, at, at this point, I. Again, I think we're beyond that from my industry's perspective. Um, so I don't 
see a need for it to be in there. I also recognize that there is a feeling as policymakers that perhaps you need to do something. Um, this falls into the bailiwick of the, of the uh, Commerce Committee. It also falls into the bailiwick of the Judiciary Committee because we touch upon both of those. The, the overwhelming majority of foreclosures go through a judicial process here in Vermont. That decision was made years ago when we put the uh, mediation program in place uh, just to basically automatically go through the courts. Um, you know, I, I guess that's where I'm at at this point. I, I did see the language that Angela and her folks worked on with legal aid, and, and I know it, it's trying to strike a, a balance there. Again, I, I would submit evictions are uh, different than foreclosure because we've got a much longer process and interactive process with the borrower that we have to go through. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions you may have and, and pledge to continue to work with your committees and others as this moves forward. Just think, a quick, just yep, a, yep, there we go. Um, first of all, just a reminder for people to uh, use the raise your hand function if you if you want to ask a question, and then. Um, but Chris, just quickly, what about the commercial side of life? And what, we had a conversation yesterday about the uh, about commercial rentals, which our attorney was David Hall was sharing that that that's a that's not part of the residential uh, landlord tenant law at all, of course. But um, also about commercial loans and what does it mean? What do you think is going to be going on with commercial loans? Uh, yeah. Federal package. So. Uh... Again, 30 seconds to digress. I'm, I'm, I'm capturing three buckets right now. The individual bucket, the business bucket, and then the municipality bucket. We're going to see a, a growing problem with regard to homeowners and business owners being able to pay their property taxes. Uh, and that's an area that we're gonna be concentrating on. I've had many conversations with the state treasurer about that very similar to what we tried to do with the municipalities during Tropical Storm Irene. From a business perspective, um, we, I guess we're on two sides of this, if you will. We've got the business owner that has the relationship with the financial institution. And then we have the property owner who may be leasing the property to the business. Uh, and they may have a financial relationship with this. It's, it's my understanding, if I heard, heard Judge Grierson yesterday correctly, that he interprets their activities within the judiciary right now to include businesses as well. In other words, they're, they're not making a bright line distinction between individuals and businesses. So um, if somebody were to file or try and go through an eviction process and have to utilize the courts, I'm not sure they're gonna get very far at this point. We are uh, seeing unprecedented requests, uh, discussions going on with the business community right now to try and help them. It is our understanding there's about $350 billion in the federal package that will be made available through the SBA Small Business Administration Program to try and help businesses get through this. It's under what they titled the Paycheck Protection Act. So it can be used as a pass through from the lender to the business to cover payroll expenses during this period of time. Some businesses can't take on additional debt. It's as simple as that it is not going to be beneficial to them. Some businesses need outright grants and we're still trying to figure out what that might look like. The challenge I see is we've got a current disaster program under SBA, which is trying to get money out the door quickly. We've got $350 billion coming from the feds and there are literally no guidelines right now. There is no structure 
to try and get those funds out the door. So our industry with SBA and others are gonna be working over the weekend to hopefully build that roadmap so that when people see and hear about this package being passed at the federal level, you know they're gonna pick up the phone and ask, how do I get into the program? And we are trying to get ready for that, hopefully by the middle, at the very latest, the end of next week, to try and bring some relief for these businesses that are out there in the marketplace. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, anything else for Chris right now? This is, it's all very sobering. And I, I think it's, you know, one of the issues is this day by day thing. I mean, it still has to, this package still has to pass the house, which I guess is expected. It has to pass, um, has to be signed by the president and then rules are going to be determined. Is that, is that your understanding that, that it's just. Um, not necessarily rules, but just the guidance and the guidelines for implementing the program, because we don't know right now, whether you're going to apply through SBA, whether you're going to apply to us as lenders, whether you're going to walk in the door as a business, having a designation already given to you by SBA, are we doing bridge loans, not doing bridge loans. If we're doing bridge loans, does the SBA funding then go to the financial institution to pay off the loan? I mean, it is mind boggling how much is going to be a part of this program and how much needs to be put in place to implement it. And we know we're on the front line of doing that or, or playing that implementation role. And it's frightening right now, not having that in place already. Well, and, and you mentioned that one of your buckets is municipalities. Yes. Um, and property taxes, obviously, is a big part of that. Um, what are you, but, but you do, the banking industry does much more than that. I mean, we're talking about bonding issues. We're talking about, um, what are we talking about besides basic fluidity here? Okay, well, really, it's, it's about cash flow. So if we go back to Tropical Storm Marine, you'll remember the losses were really related to infrastructure. We needed to get the roads and bridges and culverts put back in place. So what we did there was to provide the short-term funding to those municipalities so they can make those improvements immediately. And then we worked with the bond bank to put in place the long-term financing that the municipalities needed. It's my understanding the bond bank has shifted a little bit over the years that they're looking at capital improvements rather than cash flow issues. So what we're working on right now with the treasurer's office and trying to get from uh, yeah, we lost you. League of cities and towns is what what's the estimate? Oh, there again, our lenders have municipal relationships all over the state. So we're looking at what's the short term cash flow that they need because there is an expectation of having to uh, not just run municipal government, but also make the payments to the state on the education fund. I, I think they are obligated to do that under statute. So where do they come up with the funds to do that if they've got homeowners who and businesses who aren't able to pay their property taxes? So we're looking at some type of cash flow mechanism that we could put in place with the municipal with the municipality short-term borrowing, and then again working with the treasurer and others to figure out what the long-term uh, peace looks like. What's your worst fear before I let you go? Uh, <laughs> can we turn off the recording? Um, I, answer I, what you're comfortable answering. I yeah, just... thank you. I, I am very, very concerned about the volume of people being impacted individually and business oriented. Um, we have never seen anything like this. We are, um, while our industry as a regulated industry is prepared and has pandemic programs in place and keeping the doors open, I am fearful that the need will outstrip the resources that we have available to us. I am fearful that the longer this goes, and rightly so with regard to stay at home and so on, the deeper the damage is and the longer it will take to recover. Um, and, and 
I know that there will be business owners that won't be able to come back, period, end of discussion, no matter what we're able to do for them. Um, I, I'm just fearful overall of how devastating this will be to the Vermont economy and how we manage the $2 billion that's supposedly coming to our state in this bill, knowing there are going to have to be other bills looked at, stimulus packages looked at down in Washington, because this, uh, the effects of this will not go away quickly. Well, thank you. And thanks for weighing in on, um, on these issues. I'm sure you'll be, uh, I understand you'll be, Commerce Committee will be taking up some of the same issues next week as well. Yep. But I'm sure the world will have shifted two or three degrees between now and then uh, as well. So um, if there is information that you think we need to have, please don't hesitate to reach out so that we can get you back. Absolutely do that and greatly appreciate your time this morning. I'll stay on for a little while. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, we'll shift over now to Jean. Um, if that's okay, um, Gene, are you ready? You are, you are unmuted. Welcome. Uh, yes, I. For people who don't know me, I am Jean Murray. I am an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. I practice extensively in landlord tenant law, and as have also practiced um, some foreclosure defense cases. So in this bill, um, and we've been working since yesterday um, to reach agreement um, between the legal aid version and Angela has um, provided some really helpful suggestions from the um, uh, Landlords Association, Owners Association, I wanna get her name right. Um, and so, I just kind of like to explain what it is that section nine of the bill in front of you um, is doing. The idea is to have a moratorium on evictions. Eviction means that um, a landlord or a um, lender, mortgage lender, is using the power of the state through the courts to involuntarily remove um, somebody from their home. And in the usual course of business, this happens actually quite frequently. Um, in fiscal, state fiscal year 2019, there were 1,761 um, evictions filed and 852 foreclosures filed. Um, on the eviction side, that's about 150 evictions get fi filed a month. And on the foreclosure side, I haven't done the math, but um, hmm, about half that. So about 75 foreclosures get filed a month. So we're not in the usual course of business. So the idea of this section nine is to go to the one place and in Vermont, the one place for um, evictions and for um, writs of possession due to foreclosure, the one place that that happens is in the court. So the idea is to go to the court and to say to courts, stop, just don't do this right now. Don't do this during the state of emergency and for a short period of time after just pause. And it's, what are you pausing? You are pausing um, anything that could lead to a writ of possession. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the judiciary passed a new emergency rule, um, Administrative Order 49, in which they suspended all non-emergency hearings. But that means that um, things that any people think of as an emergency um, could happen. The cases are still pending. Deadlines are still running. Um, things could be done non-emergency. Before the state of emergency, there were a number of writs of possession outstanding, 
where somebody already in a landlord tenant case had been served with a writ of possession or had agreed to a writ of possession, thinking that after a certain period of time, they'd be able to go out and find other housing and leave the housing that was in dispute. Those are still out there right now happening every day. And um, at Legal Aid, we know of a number of cases where people who had a writ of possession served on them or they'd accepted one, haven't been able to find a new place to move and certainly under the emergency order are not really allowed to leave their houses to find a place to move to so that individually case by case people have to go to the court and ask them to stay the writ of possession this is not the courthouse doors are closed it is very difficult for pro se defendants in both foreclosures and evictions to get anything accomplished and most people are pro se as hard as we work at uh, legal services vermont and vermont legal aid not everybody comes to us um, and our, I mean, I'm at home, I, I, this is in my kitchen. We, we have to figure out, uh, just like everybody else, scrambling in ways to figure out how to help people. So the bill, um, through stopping everything that's happening at court during the state of emergency, will stop people from being put on the street during a public health emergency. And that's, what we aim to stop. Um, the um, people, homeowners who have mortgages to pay, um, certainly there has been um, relief um, for the federally funded uh, mortgage programs that have been offered. And certainly I absolutely understand that our local banks and credit unions are also not going to start foreclosure proceedings and are going to do whatever they can to put people in, in for, forbearance. But there are already a number of foreclosures that are out there with time clocks running on them. And so that this bill would stop the ones that have already been filed um, so that none of them get to the writ of possession point. Um, foreclosure process in Vermont <clears throat> after there's a judgment of foreclosure and the redemption period is run, the next step is a foreclosure sale. If uh, you are a homeowner and your property was going to go to foreclosure sale um, to pay off the amount of loan that you owed, this would not be a good time for your property to be auctioned. So um, you would not be able to pay off as much of your loan with the price that property would get. So. It's just a better idea during a state of emergency to stop everything. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, the notion, back to the eviction side, um, there has been some talk about there are some tenants who are creating such a problem that there should be an exception to an eviction moratorium. Um, and we've thought about this uh, a lot. And for, um, there's two ways of thinking, two, two thoughts about it, but let's just think about uh, tenants who are um, supposedly creating such a problem that it's a risk to the health and safety of other tenants. In landlord tenant law, there is a grounds for eviction um, where a tenant is uh, violent or engaged in criminal activity or is doing something to threaten the health and safety of other tenants. That's a regular um, grounds for eviction. Um, if during the state of emergency, someone is doing that, there are ways to um, enforce um, the governor's order that is not eviction of a tenant. So um, like if there are too many people coming in and out of someone's house, the governor's order says nobody is supposed to come in and out of a house. They're not supposed to be moving around. They, you're just supposed to go to the grocery store and the pharmacy and that's it. So 
there could be things in place to enforce the governor's order for that kind of behavior. If somebody is having a mental health crisis and is so behaviorally disordered that they are a danger to themselves or others, um, the police could be called, the mental health screeners could be called, and that individual person's um, problem could be dealt with by those other agencies short of eviction, um, which may involve uh, taking somebody uh, to the hospital or some other place. Um, so we view it as not necessary to carve out an exception to an eviction moratorium, because for folks whose behaviors are extreme, there are other ways to get those behaviors in control rather than dispossessing them from their um, homes. The other thing to think about is whether or not, if an eviction uh, moratorium happened, um, this particular bill, the first thing it says is that there is nothing in the bill that says that people shouldn't pay their rent or their mortgage payments. If people have money to pay their rent and mortgage payments, they should pay their rent and mortgage payments during the state of emergency. It is not, um, nothing in this bill says that people will not eventually owe the rent. Um, and it, it has been said that perhaps tenants particularly um, would, uh, would, would think of this as a free ride. I think that is a very negative view of who tenants in Vermont are. I think tenants, just as well as homeowners, understand their obligations to pay rent and will pay it if they have the money to pay it. And right now, because some people are out of work, they may not be able to pay right now. And while there might be rental assistance coming, right now we don't know, just um, as Chris was saying, we don't know exactly how it's coming, how it's going to be applied for, how it's going to be distributed. Um, and so what needs to happen is everybody just needs to slow down and put everything on pause until we get uh, rental relief money, um, until we get um, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, give me just one second to make this go away. Um, Are you getting a buzz? Yeah. Did you hear my, that something was ringing and it needed to stop ringing? Sorry about that. Um, so We, since we've changed the, the bill yesterday, we have worked out how um, a bunch of specific details about staying the case. Um, you had a walkthrough of the bill yesterday and what the changes are today mostly are details about exactly how that would work. The intent of the bill that got walked through yesterday is all intact. We have added one extra thing, um, which is a way to for people who need to sign notarized documents that go into court, just the ones that go into court um, would be able to, instead of notarize them, uh, uh, affirm under pains and penalties of perjury that their affidavits were correct. This already exists in the court system for electronically filed documents. There is no need for notarization. And this particular section would just expand um, the, uh, foregoing of notarization for affidavits that get need to file in court. I put in the committee documents, the Secretary of State's um, change to the notary rule to allow for remote notarization, which is, it's five pages long. It's incredibly complicated. It requires video and um, secure channels and things like that, all of which are not accessible for low-income people. So we have added that to this bill um, just for the kinds of things that need to be authorized to go into court that uh, to suspend the need for notarization for those. Um, I'm not, I did um, outline this, this same testimony I gave, I'm giving now in a, a written document that I sent in yesterday. 
Um, also, one of the documents that I sent in was excerpts from the law of the governor's power. So the governor enacted his um, state of emergency under certain powers that are given to him by statute. And those powers include um, the ability to enforce the orders that, that he makes. And so I've excerpted those statutes for you to look at too. Okay, and those are on our website. Um, yeah. um, do you have time for a couple questions? Sure. Um, John and then Chip. John. Hold on, I haven't, un I haven't been able to get you unmuted yet. Hold on. There, okay. There My, mine was for Chris, if he's still with us. I don't know if he is. Yep. Chris, are you still there? Yep, still here. Chris, when you, when you said that um, your industry is already beyond the bill, why not have all the banking institutions put out a public statement uh, uh, regarding foreclosures? Um, because that, that creates, uh, there are, if you can hear me, there are unintended consequences with that. It creates a greater expectation uh, for people in the marketplace. Our approach has been, and it's worked in the past very successfully, is to have those conversations with individual borrowers based on their unique circumstances. The federal language um, will more than likely get quite a bit of press, both here in Vermont and elsewhere around the country. So it, it's just managing a message so that you don't create unexpected, un, uh, unintended consequences and expectations that, uh, as Gene said, if somebody's paying their mortgage or, or able to pay their mortgage, um, you know, they should be able to continue to do that. So I, I hear your thoughts, but uh, that's the approach we're taking at this point, case by if, case. Okay, but if, if the if industry is beyond the bill and you can't have something public. If the, if the parameters that we have in the bill currently won't be a problem to your industry because you're already ahead of it. Well, that's true. I mean, I don't, I mean, I would defer to other people who deal with foreclosures as well. I mean, what I heard from the courts is that even if you file your paperwork, it's not going to go anywhere because they're not moving forward with it. I've got others who are not moving forward with foreclosure at all. And when you've got people who are uh, under a stay at home in order, you can't do a sale because you've got to have people who are out there on the court steps, if you will, conducting the sale. So that's not going to happen. I mean, right. that's you're why right. I say I don't think you're all in the same situation. I, I, I don't think we're oppositional. I'm just trying to get my oh, because the judiciary has said that they every it, it's how people are working in this emergency, but it's not standardized either in each, of, in each of our court systems. So it's an interesting issue of how do we do this all together? Yeah, I, I understand. I've, I've often had frustration with the lack of standardization in the courts because you can get same case, very different outcomes in two different jurisdictions. Right. So I, yeah, we're all working toward the same end game and I'm, I'm uh, please don't take me as being uh, confrontational at all. I just think at this point where we're focusing our attention is to make sure that we're working with those customers individually to make sure they understand clearly what's going on. And again, I'll assure you that our industry has no desire to throw people out of their homes at this point at all. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, John. Yep. Chip, you are up. So um, I guess a, f a few things that occurred to me um, Regarding uh, Jen's testimony, <laughs> I have to read it. <laughs> um, I guess I had um, read somewhere that sheriffs were had also issued some sort of a statement that they would not um, serve process regarding um, displacing uh, for uh, not foreclosures but evictions. Um, and I was wondering how that played in, or if, if legal aid was aware of that, and how that may play in. I also had a question about. 
um, when you speak about uh, affirmations uh, in, in, in place of uh, notaries, um, um, I'm familiar with uh, oaths of affirmation and, and those seem to be um, somewhat complicated language for pro se litigants to be um, uh, asked to do. And I was wondering if um, you had any suggestions as to um, how that might come about, how that language may be um, presented in the community to make it available to folks that may need it. Um, I, I, we reached out to the sheriffs. I understand they had a statewide call yesterday. I'm, I wasn't part of the call. I haven't seen a written statement, um, from the sheriffs, but my understanding is, um, that they, uh, that uh, some sheriffs would rather not be saw, uh, serving the civil process that is currently in their hands. Um, they don't want to send their personnel out and go door to door for service in hand. Um, in terms of any uh, final decision about what they decided to do, my impression was they were waiting um, for either this legislation or an executive order from the governor about it. Um, but this legislation would say, um, would make it clear that, let me back up a little bit, uh, a case in, in the civil division of the superior court um, under usual circumstances gets started either by filing or by service. If it is started by filing in the usual case, the plaintiff has 60 days to serve. If it is started by service, the plaintiff has to file within 21 days. This legislation would say, go ahead and file your case to preserve your statute of limitations or any other thing that you need to preserve. But so the case is commenced, but stayed immediately and a prohibition against serving it until the state of emergency is over and a prohibition against serving any um, order or any sort of process um, until the state of emergency is over. So, um, and if we did that with this legislation, then the sheriffs wouldn't have anything to serve. Um, and I understand some of them don't want to anyway. So, and the second thing about the complicated language, well, the current version of the bill that David Hall um, is, uh, posted this morning, which has some uh, things to work out, um, but he wanted to have something for people to look at, has the language, it precisely has the language. And this is language that is actually already um, part of the statute um, about uh, affidavits and, and things that need notaries because the judiciary already suspended the requirement of notaries for things that were filed electronically. And so we would just say, instead of just for things that are filed electronically, it would be everything. And there's just a little recitation of uh, swear, uh, swear or firm under pains and penalties of perjury. Um, and it would be part of a judiciary form. Thank you. All right, all set with that, Chip? Yes. All right. Um, Jean, are you all set for right now? Will you stay on the call for a little while or do you have more for us? Um, I will definitely stay on the call. I don't have anything else right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to shift over now to um, very uh, up to Angela and see if there's any further comments that Angela had on the comments that were um, shared and worked on. Thank you for showing up again and for, and for working with um, the other folks on, on these changes. Hey, you're very welcome. I just wanna uh, ensure that everybody can hear me okay. As we work yep. through these technical difficulties. Um, my name is Angela Zaykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. I'm also a practicing attorney and I represent landlords throughout the state of Vermont. Um, we, I have been working with the folks at Legal Aid um, with their uh, section nine proposal um, and I, I think with the various edits that we've come up with, it creates this uh, balanced approach uh, that will 
preserve the rights of landlords. So it's going to um, allow landlords to continue to send termination notices. It's going to allow landlords to file an eviction case. And then at the point at which the eviction case is filed, the process stops. Um, so it's being mindful of the fact that the governor has issued a stay home uh, stay safe order. And so we do not want people turned out of their homes at this time um, in keeping with that order. So it, it allows the process to continue to a point um, and then everything stops. What the bill or the proposal also does is addresses sort of these other outstanding issues, cases that have already been filed, what happens um, to some extent when the state of emergency is lifted, um, and from the landlord's perspective, a very important part of all of this is Section 7, which is the appropriation and the funding. And I know the difficulty now is that no one knows when the funding is coming, how much funding is coming, but having resources available for tenants and landlords to ensure there's not also a financial crisis in addition to this uh, is going to be uh, very important and, and paramount that I think this um, section nine that legal aid and I have been working on is about as fair as we can get to both parties, given all of the circumstances. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for working with it. Any questions for Angela? Um, and the the draft that they're talking about will will we will try to get that posted. Um, a little bit later on today um, to make sure everybody can see it for the afternoon conversation. Um, thank you, Angela. Um, John, did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Angela, over, uh, over the evening, I was reading what other regions have done and um, Governor Newsom in California had a stay of evictions until the end of May and let each city decide how to do that. But in Seattle, it was a th ending 30 days after the emergency. And I see on page 11 of your suggested notes, that's posted that you want, to, you are suggesting ending it 15 days after the termination. I, I, I'm just wondering how, we're being less generous than other communities. And I'm just wondering how you came up or how the group came up with 15 days. That's my question. Sure. And I think in the meantime, um, with conversations with Vermont Legal Aid and myself, um, we had settled on a 30 day oh, uh, time frame. Um, so I think you're, you're looking at um, yesterday before the uh, two parties that had a chance to talk. And in the meantime, we had come to an agreement on, on 30 days. I love 30 days. Thank you. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, Chip. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Um, if you could just stay on the line for a little while and see what happens when, when we get through with, um, as we go around. Um, Maura, are you here? Are you still here? Hi, Maura. How are you? Very good. How are you? Good. Um, Mora is uh, had reached out to me last night with some concerns from the Vermont Housing and Finance Authority that we did not hear anything about until until I heard um, these these um, concerns that Mora had, and I just wanted her to have the opportunity to share those with us. Um, so please go right ahead. You're uh, you are unmuted. Yeah, thank you um, so much for your leadership and perseverance in these times. As Representative Steven said, my name is Maura Collins. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, I completely support the broad goals of this legislation, and I wanted to be on the record with that. Um, the evidence of the role and importance of housing um, is reflected in the governor's, just the name of the governor's stay home, stay safe policy, and that Vermont residents can only uh, abide by this directive if they have a safe home to shelter them. I also echo Chris Delia's comments about foreclosures and evictions being very different from each other, and that the risks of homelessness and perpetuating this public health emergency 
are very different if you're talking about foreclosures or evictions. Uh, with forec VHFA is a mortgage lender, both um, with single family mortgages. Um, so we do uh, participate in foreclosure actions directly, as well as we have mortgages for multifamily rental buildings. And um, so we, we watch our, our borrowers go through the eviction process uh, with their tenants, sadly, sometimes. And with foreclosures, Chris laid out the long time that it takes when courts, even when courts are open and systems are functioning well, um, the foreclosure process is just a very long process. Uh, in Vermont, we do have a judicial foreclosure system. Um, so the, the role of the courts is imperative. And as we know, the courts um, are uh, closed to a lot of business. Um, I've seen a lot of estimates of mortgages covered or not covered by all the existing foreclosure protections that have already been announced by the feds. So I'm not going to throw my own estimates on top of all those other estimates. Um, and Chris spoke, but I will say that um, some of VHFA's mortgages are the ones that are not covered by those federal actions. A lot of our mortgages are, some are not. And why that would be is that um, this gets really complicated really quickly as Chris was laying out. And so um, I agree with him that so far VHFA um, has taken the action of not having a public decree explaining <coughs> what we're doing. And what we're doing is that we have um, stopped all foreclosures, uh, initiations, absolutely. And we have held and um, stop action on foreclosures that were in process from some of them go in and out of foreclosure several times. And so um, they could have been going on for years and we have stopped all actions so that there is no chance that, um, that we will be pushing people into homelessness or um, uh, uh, impacting their, their ability to stay safe and stay home. But we have stopped short of being public about that and um, initiating a um, big PR-based announcement um, because, as Chris said, of the potential unintended consequences. Um, it's, when I say it's very complicated, it's because Sometimes it is the lender who may be um, stopping the foreclosure action. And sometimes uh, you have to think about the mortgage insurance on the, uh, on the property and not and either abiding by those rules or, or not going afoul of those rules. So it's far better. And what we've been directing is for all of our borrowers to individually talk with their mortgage servicer or VHFA about their situation. Um, I, I know that I have read a, a bunch of social media comments in different community groups I'm a part of where um, people have heard of the federal actions and have interpreted them as much broader than uh, they are. I see people saying, oh, thank goodness the feds made it so I don't have to pay my mortgage for the next 60 days. That's not true. Um, and they are interpreting very complicated mortgage industry speak and um, making up their own interpretations of it. And I worry about those who are not talking to their servicer and, and understanding what exactly applies in their situation or not. Um, so uh, I going to the bill that you all have in front of you, I really support the funding for the state to provide emergency housing related assistance. Um, I don't know if $5 million is the right number. I'm going to trust that other people came up with that number um, based on the need, but I, I do hope that the eligibility for that assistance is broad enough to cover the broad base of need that I think um, uh, may be what we see in reality. Um, 
And as others have said, we're still trying to assess the impact of the federal stimulus that's passed. Um, you know, the third federal stimulus, um, uh, there's some direct money for housing subsidies for affordable housing projects. Previously, you know, there was an expansion of the unemployment benefits and um, expanded family leave and even healthcare premium coverage for employers. And so all those actions are going to help not only Vermonters, but the housing um, that we're talking about today of Vermonters because all those income relief programs and income support programs will help stabilize um, our housing because we'll have the money to pay our mortgages and rents. Um, I, you know, when I reached out to Tom, um, it was because mostly I'm, I'm concerned or I want everyone to be careful about the, the messaging of what you all are considering. So while um, I have a lot of support for it, um, there are, I'm worried that, you know, a big public announcement, whether it be from the administration or from the legislature or from everyone, talking about these broad-based moratoriums could be perceived as different than what I'm reading in your bill. And I appreciate Angela's testimony confirming that, you know, um, there is an expectation that everyone still, and Jean, you said it, you know, everyone still has to pay their rent and um, there's no um, uh, forgiveness of that. And instead there's, you know, this emergency assistance fund available I'm just worried about what people are going to read into this. And to the extent there are affordable housing programs that VHFA administers that I'm, it seems to maybe have slipped through the cracks in terms of the federal stimulus bill so far. Um, you've heard me testify in the past about the federal tax credit program. This is the largest uh, rental support program um, that we have in this country of creating affordable rental housing with federal tax credits. Uh, a lot of those apartments may um, finance with federal tax credits um, have deep rental assistance with them. And so I believe they're gonna be covered by the federal stimulus bill, but there's about 3,300 apartments funded with tax credits that don't have deep rental assistance and about a thousand of those have a VHFA loan on them. And um, I'm not sure what help will be for um, those projects. And so that's why I'm saying I really support the money that you have in this bill to help individuals um, like those tenants who may be eligible. Um, but, you know, I have to have a, I had a call with the state treasurer yesterday that brought this to the forefront where I don't know yet, but if by mid-April it's clear that a lot of the tenants in our um, housing that we have loans on the, on the mortgages on the property, if they do not pay their rent, then it's possible that the property owners won't be able to pay their mortgage. Uh, to VHFA or to other borrowers, uh, other lenders. And if VHFA, I'll, I can only speak for us, that if those mortgage payments, we can absorb um, some of our borrowers not making full mortgage payments, and we are kind of stress testing that scenario now. But at some point, depending on the length and severity of this crisis, at some point, if our multifamily borrowers are not able to pay us those mortgage payments, we take that money and turn around and pay our bond investors with um, those mortgage payments. And we have uh, payments due to our investors and we will need to keep paying those, um, those investors because as I have seen now, I don't see um, any legislation addressing uh, existing bonds in that way. So if we get to a point that we can't be paying our investors who we sold bonds to many, many years ago, um, we may have to call on the um, protection that the state offers VHFA's bonds. And that's called the moral obligation of the state. 
And if there was a situation where tenants aren't paying their rent, so the property owners aren't paying VHFA, so VHFA can't pay the investors, and there's not enough money to pay the investors, then the state has agreed that it will step up and backfill that money to the investors. And that was a reassurance that those investors knew about when they bought our bonds, however many years ago, it could be decades ago. And um, at this point, we see this risk as low. And in fact, I really echoed that to the state treasurer when we spoke yesterday. Um, an example of what I'm talking about, we're, we're quantifying it now, but she was asking, you know, should we have weekly calls to um, get updates on the status of this? And I said, I, I, this is such a low risk. Like we could talk about this monthly, you know, this is not something that I expect will happen anytime soon but it certainly is an outcome that I wanted to raise as a possibility because um, it is possible that we may at some point have to call on the moral obligation of the state um, in that way if this all happens. And so uh, my, uh, my concluding comments are, I support so much of this legislation. I appreciate that it includes the kind of emergency housing assistance that I think is really what's critical because we do not want anyone to become homeless or be without a home when the governor is telling us to stay safe, stay home. And so keeping people in their housing is critical to stop this public health emergency. And at the same time, I think that the messaging of what is being done by the, with this bill is going to have to be very clear so that it does not um, leave anyone with the impression that the um, what's in the bill, we need to reassure people that what's in the bill is in the bill, which is um, leaving people with this impression that they have to pay their rent and mortgages if they're able. And if they're not able, the state and the feds need to come together and make sure that they are able so that it doesn't create other financial consequences for the state um, that it can't afford. Thank you. Um, any questions for Maura right now? John, you, are, you have your hand up. John, go ahead. Maura, are, so for the foreclosure part, are you, with Chris saying that's not needed to be in this bill, or are you with Gene saying that's essential to be in this bill uh, when you support the bill? It's a good question. I have the same concern on foreclosures I do on the eviction piece, which is I'm worried about what the, the average Vermonter will read into the media coverage of this bill. Um, and so I, I know it's not necessary for VHFA. I know that we have stopped everything as I explained. Um, I hear Chris saying that all his members have stopped everything. So in that regard, it, it doesn't sound like it's necessary, but do Chris and I represent 100% of all possible scenarios? Um, I, I'm not confident of that. And, and I do want to make sure that people do not be homeless at this time. So that's a non-answer. I'm sorry, Representative. Um, but I'm, it's hard for me to imagine how people um, will hear of these broad-based moratoriums and not uh, read into it what they want to hear. OK, thank you. Okay, further questions for, for Maura right now? All right, Maura, if you could just hang out here. Um, next up, David, are you able to, to chime in? Yes. Um, so David, there's just a, if, if you could, um, I don't know if, you, uh, if you're prepared to share the screen and um, kind of go over some of the changes that were made from yesterday and mm -hmm just to confirm or just to, you know, perhaps show us what um, has been worked on, um, that would be great. Sure, and then, is the sharing uh, function working for everybody? It was rapidly shared. 
Um, okay. And just just quickly, um, when we're when we're done, I think with the converse with the direct conversation on the bill uh, this morning, we do have Earhart who is listening, who is going to share some of the um, numbers that he is aware of from the federal package that we're still waiting to um, see if it's going to be approved by the house and, and move through its process. But um, just wanted to recognize, recognize that that is still ahead of us. So David, please um, go right ahead. Sure, it, it's not a lot, uh, I'll be quick. David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, so this is a, a, a new draft. Um, the changes that are highlighted are uh, relative to what you saw yesterday. Um, you'll see the first change here in the definition of the emergency period that had been 60 days after the governor declares uh, that the emergency state is ended. This is, that's reduced to 30 days. By the way, these changes are all uh, sort of a common proposal negotiated between legal aid and the apartment owners association. So. Um, there is a, just a little bit of work still being done, um, but this is, this is what we have so far. And uh, I think it's fair to say they obviously agree to this as they proposed it. Um, so yesterday we talked about the treatment of pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. D relate to new foreclosure and ejectment actions. So the, the addition here in D2 um, for an action filed pursuant to subdivision 1A of the section, the deadline for completing service of process pursuant to BRCP3 is 60 days after the emergency period ends. So remember that for new actions, um, you could file them with the court um, and that's how you would commence it. You cannot commence it by just service of process to a defendant, but you have to actually file it with the court. And you can do that to commence it during the emergency period. But remember that it is stayed automatically as of the date of filing. So what two does, it's consistent with the current rules of civil procedure that say, if you commence an action by filing in court, you have to complete actual service to the defendant within 60 days. So that's what this says the 60 day period begins to toll at the end of the emergency period. Fairly straightforward. I, I think this is either here or somewhere around here is, is where it's probably going to be advisable to just expressly say um, that uh, all um, service is also suspended for the period of the emergency period. I think that's something still, the language is still working on that, but it was, I guess it wasn't clear to, to everyone. And then on further reflection, it wasn't really clear to me. I think it should be explicit to say that um, even though you can initiate a lawsuit, not only is it stayed, but service is gonna be stayed until the emergency period ends. Uh, I'll flag that for now. Come back to it, I'm sure. Um, these are all the same. Um, so that language along those lines was added here. Um, page 14, this new subdivision two, the effective date of a writ of possession is stayed as of the start date of the emergency period and resumes running when the emergency period ends. So again, remember that there may have been cases in which um, writs had already been issued but not served or accepted. And this just states uh, explicitly that those writs will also just be frozen in time um, until the end of the emergency period. So um, I think it's good to have that clarity in here. Um, it's consistent with what was in the draft previously. So G, resumption of rent escrow hearing. So um, remember that right now uh, in the statute, 
there can be an expedited process for non-payment and uh, a plaintiff can file a motion for an order to pay rent into court. Um, at that time, the court uh, will shall require the defendant to pay full or partial payment uh, based on the amount of rent that is accruing while the action is pending and then the sooner of the filing or the service. So um, what this change in G1 is, is wanting to do is to tell the court how that accrual method is going to work for the emergency period. So um, I, I don't think that this language is final, but I think that the plain English version of it is if you had served this motion uh, for an order to pay rent to a defendant before this act takes place, then the court would use um, the date of the end of the emergency until the hearing as the period of accrual. And um, if you serve it after this act takes effect, which would happen after the emergency ends, then that period of accrual would be from the date of service until the hearing. So I think just in plain English, that's, the, what's, that's what's trying to happen here. Um, still working on the words with Gene and Wendy and Angela, but it's, it's, that's just inside baseball at this point. In subdivision two, one addition here. So we had already said in calculating the amount to be paid in the court, the court may consider a tenant's inability to pay due to circumstances arising in the emergency period and whether the tenant made good faith attempts to secure available emergency rental payment funds. So remember the function of this is to give discretion to the court on how much it can require a tenant to pay in the court, really trying to avoid the situation in which um, a proceeding has been stayed um, or has been filed, but nothing is happening for six months because the emergency is still going on and then they show up to court and the court says, all right, well, it's been eight months, so you owe us eight months of rent. That's what one and two are trying to do. Two gives the court flexibility, um, but it also says the court is allowed to consider whether the tenant attempted to mitigate the loss um, by going through some of these channels for emergency relief. And again, that's a consensus proposal from the uh, advocates. Um, 15 H is highlighted, but it's 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 similar to what was there yesterday. It just says that the judiciary, working with landlords, legal aid stakeholders, are go they're going to come up with a plan for the orderly adjudication of state ejectment and foreclosure actions. Um, this last piece, this new section, this is new to the bill, section 10. This is the part that Gene was speaking to earlier. So uh, the change here is. Uh, the, the, the notary requirements and it's expanding it from electronic filers to all filers as long as they include the statement um you know that it's true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and if it's not you're subject to penalty perjury so um policy choice um and then the effective dates are the same for now so that's that's what we have David, we've got uh, two hands up right now. Um, Tommy, you're up. Let me just unmute you. you go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, David. You just touched on something that that is I've been thinking about since yesterday. Uh, you're looking at the accrual of rent, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the case of somebody who's who, who's in who's been stayed mm -hmm. in the eviction process, and uh, but I'm perhaps more concerned with the people who were not involved in eviction process before the state of emergency, were not able to pay rent. Uh, the state of emergency exists for six months and now suddenly they owe eight months rent. And I wouldn't want them to be facing eviction because of that. And I just don't know if there's a way to address that at all. Or, or am I getting way too deep in the weeds? I don't know. 
but that's a concern. That somebody... If I hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Well, if I hear your question, you're not necessarily talking about the rent escrow requirement. Um, no. You're, you're talking about somebody not being able to pay their rent. Right, yeah. And, and so perhaps there was no eviction process or ejectment process filed before the state of emergency. It's just they've lost their job and they can't afford to pay their rent during the state of emergency. And uh, and so perhaps they're not forced to pay during the state emergency. When it's done, they owe several months rent. Uh, I just don't know how to address that. So they're not facing eviction because of that. Well, so remember that this this bill does not uh, negate the duty uh, to pay rent. I mean, right. Tenants right. are still supposed to pay rent, even though there is an emergency period. I understand um, that. But if they have lost their job, they may not be able to pay the rent. Of course. And, yeah. For several months. Yeah, no, I, I think that's the fundamental problem, economic problem that you guys are wrestling with. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer for that, I mean. Okay, well, I'm just wondering if there's something we can address, I, but I don't know how, but thank you. Okay, um, John. Hold on a second. John, are you on yet? No. All right, John, you're on. Okay, thank you. David, I, I have just three little points that I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, and on page 12, we talk about it 60 days after the emergency. But then on page 14, um, on lines... Two, there, should it, should it have... The effective date of the state start date of the emergency and resumes when the emergency period ends, or should that be 30 days after the emergency period ends? I'm just not sure I understand. Sure. Um, so the reason that it's emergency period plus 60 days above um, is because that relates to the time that you have to complete service after filing an action. So Again, right now, under the rules of civil procedure, if you initiate a court case by filing a complaint with the court, then within 60 days, you have to send a copy of that filing to the defendant to complete okay. service of process. Okay, but so, isn't, our, isn't our framework here 30 days after the emergency period ends? Right, so... so uh, the emergency period, as defined, will be March 13th until the declaration, plus 30 days. Okay. Got and it. And then I, it'll I, be 60 days beyond that to complete service. Perfect. Thank you for that. And then one last one on page 15, uh, when it says, during the emergency period, the judiciary consultates with landlords for and other realm will still design a plan. Doesn't this bill say what the plan is? And so does the judiciary or normally meet with Vermont landlords and legal aid or um, is this necessary? I, I'm not sure what this gives us. That's, sure. I, that's the question. What sure. Is it I, I think you could, you could try to put a whole lot more shape on this if you wanted to, but here's the basic problem this is trying to address you're gonna have an emergency period that lasts who knows how long, plus 30 days. And at that time, when that emergency period ends after those 30 days, you're going to have however many tens, dozens, scores, hundreds of cases that are piled up and waiting to be adjudicated. And those are gonna involve evictions on top of all the other things. It may include foreclosures, depending on what you do here. But basically, this is telling the courts to work with all the people who are involved in these kinds of cases to say, once the uh, floodwaters are released, how in the world are we gonna accommodate several hundred cases that are all backlogged? 
I, I don't know what that's going to look like. It could look like uh, it could look like emergency rules that the court adopts. It could look like they give priority to cases based on when they were filed or whether you have kids or I don't know what. Um, I, I, I think nobody knows. And so the the purpose here, and I can certainly let Jean and Wendy and Angela and others speak to this, but my understanding of the purpose here is to have some some kind of plan in place for when this is hopefully all over, we figure out how to manage the backlog of work in the courts that will inevitably arise from this. Yeah, I, I guess my worry is that the judiciary is already putting this in such low priority because it's so stressed with not being open and all the other cases that in the middle of this, we're asking them to come up with a plan for a low priority thing for them. So it, I, 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 it may be worth hearing from Judge Gerson about. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think you're right. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right. Chip, go right ahead. So David, I just want to make this, uh, this uh, clarification here. So at the end of the period of, of uh, emergency in 30 days, um, it is anticipated that there'll be an open and evidentiary hearing in the court to determine how and how much uh, the payments will be to accommodate these arrears. Is that what I'm seeing? If a plaintiff uh, exercises that right under 12 VSA 4853A, uh -huh. so it may not necessarily, that, you know, it's not every case where that's going to happen, but I mean, the purpose of that provision of law was to try to expedite the process of hearings for non-payment of rent and to try to give security to the parties by having the court serve as an escrow agent. Mm -hmm. And then if the tenant doesn't follow through with the requirements to pay into escrow, then they, the landlord gets a writ of possession and okay. the case is closed. But at that time, a, a determination would be made as to uh, you, you suggested that um, all cases will not uh, be uh, a declaration uh, by the court that all cases will be all rent is due at one time. These, these are considerations that, as you suggested uh, in, in, in response to John's question was, you know, situations, families, I mean, actually, um, families and children are taken into consideration on eviction process as, at this time. But um, so that those considerations would be um, offered in a hearing that would uh, somehow mitigate the uh, amount of, um, needed to be paid at one time. That's definitely the purpose of the subsection okay. G. It's okay. to, I mean, right now the court has the duty under statute to determine how much it will require okay. the defendant to pay in. And this tries to put some shape around, you know, what is the accrual period and then what are your circumstances? That, that answers my question. Thank you, David. Sure. <clears throat> All right, Gene, you're up. I'm going to unmute you. Um, so you I wanted to respond to Representative Waltz's uh, question, which was, um, what happens when we come out of the state of emergency and somebody simply hasn't done anything. Um, I, I agree that we need to work on the messaging that people should be during this time paying um, what they can. If someone has lost their job, they should be applying for unemployment compensation, which isn't going to be perhaps as much as they earned on their job, but it's going to be something. Um, when rental assistance programs get up, they should be applying for those and um, giving the rental assistance that they receive to their landlord. And is it possible that somebody who is renting an apartment and lost their job and, and is sitting home during the state of emergency has panicked and withdrawn and not accessed services um, that they uh, could be accessing during this time. It, it is possible, but that seems to me one of the reasons for um, one of the earlier um, thoughts, which is uh, to have the federal relief money that's coming to our housing agencies 
um, beef up the housing agencies so that they can help people who, um, for whatever reason, um, become hard to house, um, be, maybe because of inability to pay, maybe because of uh, uh, mental health issues, and maybe even new mental health issues that come up because of the crisis. So it, it, hopefully most Vermonters will be able to avail themselves of the programs that are available to them. But I guess we can expect that some won't be able to, and they'll need extra help um, from housing agencies. Um, and maybe that will become clear at the point where uh, we go to court. So right now, uh, Legal Aid is working in a pilot program in Frank Franklin County that brings all of the helping agencies and legal aid together at the time of evictions. And maybe we're gonna need to expand that to help some of these people who have uh, become uh, unable or whatever, panicked, I would say. So we'll, we'll just have to see how that plays out. But the intent here is that for people who can pay, they will continue to pay as much as they can because they are going to owe the entire amount um, at the end of the state of emergency. Um, yeah, I took a note about Representative Triano's question, but I not a very good note, so I don't, I'll stop there. Thanks, Jean. And I think that's the program that we've talked about in committee where there's a rental arrearage program that already exists through the HOP grants and that there's been a request to continue funding it and to try to expand what you've done in Franklin County uh, to further counties um, across the state. All right, any further questions for David Hall at this time? Um, so seeing no other hands up, right now, David, thank you. Um, we are going to move in. So David, I think our conversation on this bill will probably be ending right now. There's, um, there will be, I imagine, some more information coming from department owners and legal aid, hopefully, you know, early this afternoon that we can make their final adjustments for the for today. On this bill, I think it's clear that with everything changing um, all the time that you know, we'll probably hear more early next week when we meet next, whenever that will be on this bill um, and on what the federal stuff is. I mean, this is pretty sobering information to hear from, from the banking side of it about what the, what the dangers are and what the processes might be. Um, but I think there's also a strong desire to make sure that everyone is covered as best we can um, so that no one goes homeless. I mean, it's great to hear that no one is, is pushing foreclosures um, or evictions at this time. That's, that's, the right, that's the right process, but we wanna make sure that, especially when, as things move on, that people are covered. So um, thank you all, Jean and, um, Angela and, and David, and um, I know there's been others who have been working on this as well. Thank you. Um, I wanna shift over to um, Earhart. I had promised him some time to go over the, um, the information, the money, the, you know, the, the processes that he's aware of with, um, with uh, the federal pro the, the federal bill as it stands right now. So Earhart, I will um, pass you the microphone. We are scheduled to finish up by 1245, just to give everybody a time frame. Um, so Earhart, please, uh, thank you for waiting and, and go right ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Representative Stevens. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, again, uh, for the record, Eric Monica um, for the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Hope everyone's doing well uh, today and surviving the, the crisis uh, in place. Um, I just, as a quick kind of caveat, I just want to say that I was not able to listen in directly to a lot of the prior testimony. Um, so hopefully I won't be repeating anything, but um, I was on a call of uh, pretty much all the nonprofit housing providers this morning and listening in on that and hearing what folks out in the field uh, are, uh, are dealing with. Um, 
And so I, I will uh, focus on the federal relief package as it relates to housing and homelessness, but um, I, I know you guys were not able to hear from either uh, Rick DeAngelis or from uh, Rena Markley yesterday uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, you did hear from Chris Donnelly, uh, who I think gave a, a pretty good picture of what uh, some of the uh, housing and homeless service providers are seeing around the state. But uh, I, Mr. Chair, if, if, if I may, um, Rita sent a, um, an email to both Ron and me apologizing for not being able to uh, be there um, to, to testify yesterday. And I think if I, if you could indulge me for a moment, if I can find it, I would like to just quickly read it because I think it gives uh, you all uh, a, a, a better sense of um, what actually uh, folks that are at the ground level in the homeless shelters are, are dealing with. Um, it's, so uh, uh, posted to yesterday's documents if people are looking for it. Yeah, I, I think you, there was one email that was not on yesterday's documents that um, I, I, I didn't see the whole thing, Ron, but <clears throat> Uh, let me just quickly highlight it for folks. Um, so this is Rita uh, Markley from the Committee on Temporary Shelter just uh, emailing to say she can't join uh, the, yesterday's call. Right now I'm coordinating the Burlington COVID response team for homeless uh, people. That means helping with new quarantine and recovery site, uh, logistics, supplies, support for all Chittenden County shelters. Uh, the flow of referrals to isolation units, dealing with the mayor's office, the University of Vermont Medical Center and so on. All of that on top of keeping the four emergency shelters that COTS runs uh, on, is running on very depleted staff. I'm backup support for our skeleton crew, so it's not even certain that I'd be able to make the call at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, so that, that was in regards to her not being able to make it uh, yesterday. And I, I just, I, I think that the urgent nature of what folks have been dealing with, and I hope you've had a chance to review the materials that um, Rick DeAngelis submitted, um, you know, what they've done in Central Vermont is just absolutely Herculean in terms of um, having three homeless uh, shelters, one permanent and two uh, seasonal uh, temporary shelters relocated to uh, to a motel and now providing 24-7 uh, support to the people in that motel is, is, is just a tremendous effort. Um, and I, I think all of that gives you a sense of what uh, our housing and, and homeless service providers are, are, are dealing with uh, around, uh, around the state. Uh, and I would urge you as you continue to take testimony, I think I mentioned this yesterday, uh, to get Sarah Phillips on. Um, and to uh, have Sarah give you all um, a sense of, because uh, she's coordinating this together uh, with Jeffrey Pippinger in uh, DCF Commissioner's Office and, and a, just a, a whole array of other folks. Uh, they're coordinating this effort statewide. They have uh, week, weekly um, uh, call-ins uh, and are obviously in, in touch. I think they're, you know, those folks are working every, long hours every day, including, uh, including on weekends. And, Pretty much the same is true for our uh, housing, affordable housing providers who um, in so many different ways are supporting that network of uh, homeless ser um, service providers as well. Um, but yeah, basically the shelters really, in order to um, comply with uh, all of the CDC and the health department um, uh, guidance on uh, social distancing have had to either empty their shelters or significantly reduce the census of those shelters. Um, and also beyond shelters, a number of our affordable housing nonprofits are uh, own and operate congregate uh, housing uh, and or single room occupancy where there's shared bathroom and kitchen facilities. And so those, those are a critical issue as well because people um, you know, are not able to maintain all the social distancing when they have shared uh, those kinds of shared facilities. Um, that's just a, a quick kind of snapshot of, of some of the issues that folks are dealing with. Let me also say, having heard some of uh, the conversation around uh, lost uh, lost rental income as a result of uh, COVID-19 related job um, losses. I would also urge you to hear from um, Chris Saunders from Leahy's office. Uh, he gave, uh, I thought, a, a really uh, good analysis of the um, COVID-19 federal relief package um, provisions as they relate to unemployment insurance and, and leave. And they're really uh, actually 
very substantial. And uh, my general takeaway, though I'm not a specialist in, in that area, my general takeaway is that um, people, there will be opportunities for um, people to um, lose less income than one might uh, imagine in this crisis and given the number of uh, unemployment insurance filings. So I think having Chris and obviously the uh, Commissioner of uh, Labor maybe come in um, as, as well to, to talk about those provisions. Um, one of the materials switching to the um, federal um, the federal package itself uh, as it relates uh, to housing, um, I, I just wanted to draw to your attention. Uh, there's a number of materials that I submitted to Ron um, and Ron, I don't know if you're able to pull, uh, pull these up. Um, the one that I'd like to maybe start off briefly focusing on is, um, and I'm trying to pull it up on my own uh, screen here. Um, yeah, it's uh, Earhart, a, an analysis are, by the Earhart, National Long-Term Housing Coalition. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. You have the capability to share what's on your screen. Got it. If, if you're on your if you're on your laptop, just go down to the bottom of the screen where it says share screen and you may be able to get there. OK, let me uh, make sure I have the right thing on my screen. Uh, there we are. OK. Sorry, this is taking a little bit. Ah, there we go. I can do it if you prefer. I've got it. I had too many things on my screen. Um, can you all see something uh, entitled Congressional Leaders Agree to Coronavirus Response Package? No, no. no. Let, all right, let Ron do it. So that's the one you want to see? Yeah, I've actually lost Somehow I've now lost control over my own screen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's dangerous, Earhart. You don't want to lose uh, yeah. control over your own screen. So yes, okay. So Ron's <laughs> gonna Ron's gonna bring up the congressional leaders. Yeah. Okay. Right, now it says that Earhart Bonka has started sharing the screen. All right. So I'm scrolling. Yeah. So this is an analysis by our National Association, the National Income Housing Coalition. It's pretty detailed and niche for you know us housing uh, housing folks, um, but I think it is worth um, your uh, taking the time to to read this because it has a lot of really good information. Some broader information also about the um, the the federal relief bill, um, which again it hasn't passed yet. Um, it's hopefully going to pass the house today. And, um, you know, first of all, as I think you all know, it's, it's a, a 2 trillion, um, well, 2 trillion in, in direct spending. And I'm going to just scroll down to some of the major provisions. Um, so, um, there are, there is a, a, a quick, um, summary at the, uh, okay, near I'm, the top I'm, of page I'm, two of yeah, the HUD Earhart, related. I'm going Earhart, I just have to cut in. So, Actually, Sorry. what we're seeing is Ron's screen and not your ah, okay. screen. So if you can be specific to where you yeah. want to go, then Ron can get us there. Okay. Um, so I would could, could we go back up, Ron? It's unfortunate because I highlighted the sections I wanted to review with yes. you, uh, you folks on my screen. So, um, so do you see it? Do you see it from Ron's screen? I do. I'm I'm on it now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Ron is controlling this as opposed to as opposed to me. That was a question. Yes. Okay. So um, Ron, if you could uh, start scrolling down, and I'll ask you to stop. Okay. Maybe right there. Right there. All right. In uh, the paragraph that begins uh, with overall, um, so there you get an overall picture of uh, the HUD uh, funding at a national level. There's uh, $12 billion. And, and just again, by way of reference, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, is the major uh, funder for um, housing and community development um, throughout, uh, through, through the federal government. Um, 12 billion for HUD, uh, it breaks down uh, 4 billion for emergency solution grants, uh, which provide a broad array of assistance uh, to homeless service providers, 
um, that uh, money filters down. And uh, one of the other things that I sent you guys was a press release from uh, Leahy's, Senator Leahy's office, because uh, of course, Senator Leahy was pivotal in negotiating uh, all this as vice chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, and, and Polly Major, I'm sure, would be happy to um, speak to you guys in more detail about uh, some of this. Uh, but that $4 billion in emergency solution grants for homeless assistance uh, filters down to approximately $4.7 uh, million to the state of Vermont. Uh, the next item in that paragraph, $5 billion in community development block grants. Um, this is uh, broad assistance um, that uh, flows through the Department of Housing and Community Development and uh, Burlington, the city of Burlington gets its own um, uh, small allocation. Uh, that filters down to about $4.7 million also for the state of Vermont. Uh, of which I believe about 500,000 goes to the city of Burlington. Uh, so both of these sources, I would say, are uh, two of the first line uh, kind of COVID-19 um, uh, response uh, sources for emergency relief funding for what the, the homeless um, shelter and provider community is doing in response and uh, what the housing community, the nonprofit housing community is doing in response. Uh, a lot of the provisions of um, the regulations around both of these programs um, have been waived. Um, the analysis goes into that a little bit further uh, on in the analysis. Uh, but for instance, um, one of the community development um, block grant rules that is waived is that um, that money can be used for rental assistance uh, for folks who have uh, uh, are unable to pay the rent as a result of uh, the coronavirus crisis. Um, also, it goes uh, back to allowing uh, people to receive benefits uh, from before um, it, it, retroactively, which is uh, a waiver of a, a, a standard provision. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in, uh, that's being granted in those funds. Also, the uh, there's normally a um, percentage limit on how much of community development block grants can be spent for public services, um, that percentage is uh, lifted as well. So they're trying to make the money uh, as flexible as possible for uh, homeless and housing providers to address the crisis. Uh, jumping back to the emergency solutions grants, I mean, those can be for anything from uh, you know helping uh, to uh, fund uh, the motel, uh, the motel housing that is being procured, uh, additional staffing costs uh, for cleaning and supplies. People are experiencing in the homeless shelters that are remaining open, as well as in the motels. There's, uh, you know, intense, um, uh, uh, greater cleaning requirements due to the coronavirus. Um, so people are experiencing a, a lot of additional costs uh, across the board um, for, uh, you know, for what what they're doing. So. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we don't know exactly how this is all going to flow yet, um, um, but um, hopefully these sources will provide uh, some relief. Uh, also in this paragraph is uh, $1.25 billion for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, this is uh, what the program that's also uh, normally uh, referred to as Section 8, as tenant-based Section 8. So these are the vouchers that um, individual uh, households um, uh, uh, may have. Um, and so as those folks um, who are losing uh, potentially their income, uh, their uh, rents can be adjusted upwards and uh, the source for the additional uh, emergency funding for anyone within the Housing Choice Voucher Program that's uh, lost income as a result of COVID-19 um, would come through this source. Uh, there's also in uh, next item in that paragraph is one billion um, for project-based rental assistance. Um, and so we have uh, a number of our housing um, uh, nonprofits, uh, as well as some um, uh, private for-profits have what are known as project-based uh, Section 8 contracts where um, the operating subsidy, the, the rental assistance actually is tied to the unit. And so to the extent that uh, folks in those uh, units are losing income as a result of uh, the crisis, uh, this money would be meant to uh, help make up uh, the difference in their lost income so that those folks are made whole for, uh, for rent. Um, there's also money for public housing. Um, we still do have some public housing in the state of Vermont, though uh, a fair amount of our public housing is being converted to something called RAD, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. And RAD, um, RAD units uh, are now uh, under project-based assistance for, uh, for the most part. So uh, they would hopefully be made whole that way. Um, 
let's see. Uh, and we obviously don't know exactly how much would come to the state of Vermont under the housing choice voucher program or the project based rental assistance or public housing. Uh, that is something that, uh, you know, those are analyses that are being done on an individual basis by our housing, our, our affordable housing providers and uh, the public housing authorities. Um, those, uh, I don't know if Maura is still uh, on the call um, or on the on the meeting, but uh, VHFA and I believe uh, VHCB are uh, collecting those analyses uh, as they come in to aggregate them. Uh, I will tell you, I've done kind of a quick back of the envelope calculation uh, on units that are not going to be covered, um, which are, uh, there are quite uh, a substantial number of um, federally uh, subsidized units through the federal low-income housing tax, tax credit program that do not have uh, this kind of rental assistance in them. And those are probably, at, uh, right now, I don't see a whole lot um, other than some of the uh, general um, coronavirus uh, relief funding that goes to uh, the state and uh, uh, counties and, and uh local jurisdictions, um, that is very flexible funding and can be used for uh, rental uh, assistance or um, um, for making up for lost uh, lost rent. That is a potential source for our uh, uh, developments that just have federal uh, low-income housing tax credits in them without operating subsidies like Section 8. Now, I am concerned, uh, and I, the whole network is concerned about those um, those units and and what um, you know what their rental losses might be and, and that's still to be determined uh, what that amount might be but some back of the envelope calculations that I've done um, are you know lead me to believe that those are you know probably in the 10 million plus uh, dollar vicinity for uh, say the next uh, the next four months but we're, we're hoping to get that fine-tuned by um, the nonprofits themselves. Um, and uh, aggregated by uh, by the, the funding agencies like VHFA and, and, uh, and VHCB. Um, the other thing, obviously, that is of, uh, of deep concern would be for um, you know the uh, private for-profit landlords that uh, are uh, you know that are members of Angela's Association, and and we uh, fully support um, all the work that's been done, the good work that's been done on the. Um, moratorium aspect of the bill, but um, you know what makes it work is is the need to make sure that uh, folks are made whole, whether they be nonprofits or uh, or for profits. Um, I'll stop there um, and yep. see if folks have uh, any questions uh, right now for anything that I've covered so far. Um, any questions for Earhart? It is. I'm just going to do a time check here. It is um, 12:38. Um, so if there's any questions um, before we can wrap up, then I see Representative Gamash. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Mariana. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Earhart, for that wonderful breakdown. Um, I can't write as fast as you spoke. So I'm wondering <laughs> if you could supply us with um, a breakdown of those um, within that paragraph, all the topics that you mentioned, the energy emergency solutions grants and the community development blank block grants, et cetera, all the sub um, categories under those, each of those um, uh, blocks, if you could provide that information, basically just uh, listing the amounts of yeah. money uh, and for what they were within those particular items and sure. and make that available make them available um that would be extremely helpful and very um, much appreciated. Th th thank you representative gamash uh, ron if you could briefly kind of scroll down a little bit um further um so um stop right there uh so this is a um a very uh i, I would say high level and yet detailed analysis. And uh, Ron just stopped on the moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures section. This gives you a little bit more information uh, on exactly what the bill does. I know you heard from Chris Delia uh, this morning. Uh, and Ron, if you could keep um, scrolling down. Um, so here you have the emergency solutions grants. Um, if you could stop there and there's you know several paragraphs that sort of detail um, what emergency solutions grants can fund, um, what some of the, um, 
uh, regulatory relief or regulatory waivers that are being provided uh, are here. And, and Ron, if you could keep scrolling, there's another section uh, a little further down on, there it is, community development block grants. So most of what I covered um, was sort of high level synopsis of uh, what you uh, what you can uh, get in this analysis if if you have uh, time to to read the whole uh, read the whole thing uh, I think it would provide a you know a wealth of uh, of information for you and I don't think I said anything that wasn't uh, covered in some way in this in this analysis. Um, I'll also quickly just refer you to uh, two other things that I uh, sent to Ron. One was uh, just a quick budget chart that. Uh, breaks down in, in a table format um, the uh, federal, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, by, line by line, um, the HUD, um, uh, the HUD aspects um, of the bill, um, and that'll give you sort of, you know, the, the uh, there it is, uh, how much for tenant-based rental assistance, how much for public uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third thing um, that I provided was a press release from Senator Leahy, which uh, provides uh, to the extent that uh, they were able to analyze uh, the uh, breakdown for Vermont, um, how much Vermont would receive from several of these. So if you scroll down on that, Ron, um, near the bottom of the page is a bulleted list of uh, the breakdowns um, for, uh, for it's stop right there, uh, for Vermont. Um, and it goes beyond uh, HUD, uh, but on the second line there, you see the 4.7 million for community development uh, block grants. Um, there's uh, uh, 5 million for community service block grants. And I'll just quickly mention that because I didn't before. Uh, that goes, that is core funding for the community action agencies, the CAPs, the five CAPs around the state. Um, and that uh, will go, flow through the Office of Economic Opportunity directly to the CAPs for their COVID-19 um, response. Um, there's also $4.3 million in additional child care development block grant funds, um, which flows through DCF to, uh, to our child care centers uh, for subsidies uh, for low-income folks around the state. Um, uh, there um, you have um, 4.6 million uh, for uh, housing assistance grants through, uh, the, through HUD. Um, there's LIHEAP dollars, 4.1 million uh, for low-income uh, home energy assistance program. That's money that also flows um, through, uh, through DCF uh, for both uh, heating and cooling. That's gonna help uh, folks who may have, uh, you know, we're still not quite out of it, um, out of the heating system, uh, excuse me, out of the uh, heating season. Um, so folks who may have, uh, who may be accruing bills right now as a result of job loss, uh, they can get assistance um, for uh, their their um, fuel bills uh, through that. So there's a, it's just a very large array uh, of funding um, through this bill, and it's it's really a lot to uh, to wade through. Uh, it's not just housing. Uh, there's um, the, thanks to Senator Leahy's uh, mantra of small state minimum. Um, the state of Vermont is getting 1.25. Uh, um, billion dollars uh, in broad-based uh, relief um, that is going to be usable for a variety of uh, different COVID-19 related responses. Um, and that is not money uh, that can uh, be used to replace uh, existing revenue losses. So it really does need to be uh, for COVID-19 and it's for any um, any COVID-19 related expenditures uh, that uh, come from March 1st right through to uh, December uh, December 30th, uh, December 31st. So um, that's that's a substantial uh, pot of money uh, that is very broad and very flexible um, that supplements these individual line items that I've uh, that I've mentioned, which, as I think I said before, could be used uh, also um, for um, lost rental income to assist um, both for and nonprofit landlords for their losses. OK, so you got that, Representative Gamash. I'm going to mute you, John. Um, yes, we have thank like you. We have like one minute left, John. Um, you all set? Okay. All right, everybody. Um, I really want to adhere to the schedule because it's lunchtime. We have about an, we're going to be back here at two o'clock. Uh, so Ron, if you could take us off of YouTube, that would be great. And then.